Their role is uh, to be spectators, not participants in action. Uh, they have no. And how do we do this? Well, he was an intellectual, so he said we do it by manufacturing consent. Uh, the business world takes a parallel view. Uh, they're not opposed to manufacturing consent, but they, uh, their main emphasis is on marginalization. Uh, disempower people, make them feel alone, uh, direct them to, actually I'm quoting now, uh, the fashion, the uh, superficial things of life, like fat, uh, like fashionable consumption, uh, and impose a philosophy of futility. And uh, that's a, that's a good part of what the media are about. It's probably the main part. Uh, the more intellectual component, if you like, is uh, indoctrination. No, in the United States, it's not a totalitarian state, so you don't get a propaganda alarm. What you get is something much more subtle but similar, uh, namely a vigorous debate within uh, a framework of fixed and unquestionable presuppositions. And it's those presuppositions that are, prop that are the propaganda line. So take, I don't know, say the war in Vietnam or anything you like. Uh, war in Vietnam, the presupposition is, well, a quote from the left end, Anthony Lewis, uh, we began with uh, blundering efforts to do good, but uh, by 1969 we found that it was a disaster which was too costly for ourselves, uh, so therefore we should get out. That's the left. Uh, the right says, uh, you're selling us out, we can win if we go in and fight harder. All of it assumes that the U.S. attack against South Vietnam was a defense of South Vietnam, uh, that it was an effort to do good, and then we can debate the tactics. Uh, that's, uh, 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 that's perfect propaganda. If dictators had any brains, they'd do the same thing. Or to take a current example, a day or two ago, there's a, oh, yesterday, I think, there was an article, in, an op-ed in the New York Times by Sal, uh, Salman Rushdie uh, ridiculing critics of the war. Take a look at what he regards as critics of the war. Critics of the, of the war in Afghanistan. Uh, critics of the war are people who uh, <clears throat> thought that bombing wouldn't work, or who thought that a ground invasion would be necessary. Uh, and this he somehow identifies with the anti-war movement. Actually, he's describing the right wing. Uh, that's where most of that criticism was coming from, but you can't say that because it doesn't. The, the purpose is to bash the anti-war movement. But What's interesting is the nature of the criticism. It's purely tactical. You, know, it's, 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 you thought the tactics weren't going to work. Ha, 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 they worked fine. Uh, so therefore, they, everything was right. It's the only question you can ask. I mean, we, we didn't ask that question about the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Or take, say, the, the Russian invasion of, uh, take, say, Czechoslovakia in 1968. <clears throat> tactics worked fine. You know, it didn't kill a lot of people. So what was wrong with it? Well, we all know what was wrong with it. You know, it didn't matter that it worked. It was irrelevant. It didn't matter that they didn't kill many people. Uh, what, what mattered is uh, what, what they were up to. That's what mattered. It doesn't matter whether it worked or not. But that kind of question you cannot ask about ourselves. Uh, if you ask that about ourselves, it, in fact, you know, it, it doesn't even happen. But there's a whole, uh, just to prevent the heresy, even though it barely exists, there's a very impressive array of devices that have been constructed just in case the heresy of being honest ever arises. Uh, there are even terms that are used, like uh, uh, moral relativism. Moral relativism means we apply the same standards to ourselves that we apply to others. Or uh, moral equivalence. A notion I think was invented by Gene Kirkpat Kirkpatrick, as far as I recall, to prevent uh, looking at ourselves. If you do it's moral equivalence, or it, or it takes a anti-Americanism. Actually, this Salman Rushdie article was called anti-Americanism. It's a kind of interesting notion. Uh, that's a notion that's used, don't, as far as I know, only in totalitarian states. So, in the Soviet Union, uh, the old Soviet Union, uh, to be anti-Soviet was a terrible crime. Uh, <clears throat> if uh, under the Brazilian generals, to be anti-Brazilian was a crime, uh, were the uh, you know, were the Russian dissidents anti-Russian? Of course not. 
they were opposed to the policies of the state, you know, in favor of uh, helping the people. Uh, if you had a, a book called, uh, somebody, suppose somebody published a book called uh, Anti-Italianism, uh, uh, referring to people in Italy who criticized government policy. Now, what would the reaction be in the streets of Milan? And people would laugh. There's no such thing as anti-Italianism. When you criticize state policies or economic policies, then you're not anti-Italian. In fact, you're pro-Italian. But in a, in a state that has no, in, a, in an intellectual culture that has no conception of democracy, uh, it becomes anti-Americanism. And it's quite striking that this is very common. It's used freely in the United States. You know, there is a book called The Anti-Americans, referring to people who criticize U.S. government policy. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, the author of that book happens to be a Soviet scholar, so he knows exactly what model he's following. Uh, but it's treated with respect. Uh, Rushdie's talk, the discussion of anti-Americanism, namely claiming that the bombing isn't going to work when it did, uh, it's similar. Uh, and it's one of these devices that's used to try to intimidate uh, people and prevent them from uh, adopting the heresy of honesty, of applying to ourselves the same standards we apply to others, elementary honesty. Uh, so the, the the barriers to the heresy are erected even when the heresy barely exists, uh, at least in the mainstream, because it's considered very dangerous. You really have to control people. And it's particularly dangerous in democratic societies. In fact, the major propaganda systems of the 20th century have grown out of the most democratic societies, uh, England and the United States. And they're the core of the public relations movement. Uh, they, in fact, uh, had the first state effective state propaganda systems during the First World War. He says, did the success of the film give you any insights into the potential of independent media to make a difference in the world? I think, uh, yeah, I think the success of the film was <clears throat> remarkable. I mean, I couldn't have imagined, I don't think anybody imagined that it would be anywhere near that successful. Uh, and what it, uh, let's go back to that question I asked, the people, the letters that I get. Uh, I thought I was the only person in the world who felt this. Well, there's a huge number of people like that, and these are ways to reach them, to help them get confidence, to help them in, uh, invigorate them so they want to do something. They realize they're not alone. Uh, there are things they can do. There are things they can achieve. Uh, that's uh, high-level high organizing and education. So there's hope. Oh, yeah.